Guys, we got a lot of intriguing matchups on the horizon, some fights that are our booked and some that we have been kind of teased and, you know, fights, a lot of back and forth on social media between a lot of high profile fighters. Nothing is really coming to fruition when you think of like your Conor McGregor's of the worlds and your, your uh, Dustin Poirier's. They've been clamoring for fights. So we're going to discuss right now which fights that we want to see in the near future in the next couple of months that aren't necessarily booked yet. I'm going to throw it to you, Ant, first. What is a matchup that is on your radar that you would like to see very soon? All right, so I'm going to have to tap into my my wishes long term for the sport. Just a matchup I've wanted to see forever, and I think a lot of people have wanted to see forever. The circumstances lined up now more perfectly than ever. Give me Dominic Cruz versus Jose Aldo. It, cool. It's about time we see that fight between two all-time greats, two legends, um, both suffering pretty brutal losses in their last outings, uh, attempting to get Bantamweight titles. So why not now we just put them together? Um, they're probably headed in the same direction in their careers. I, I, I'd assume that we're seeing the back half uh, of what both of them have to offer. And why not? It just sounds fun. Style wise can be intriguing. And hey, you could even put that as a headliner. And I think it will sell at least remotely decent. So I'm all in for for Aldo versus Cruz. Man, that's a good matchup. And if you like that idea and if you like Ant's face, hit the thumbs up on this video and subscribe to the channel. Drake, give me a matchup, man. Well, that was actually one of mine. And so great minds <laughs> think alike, my man. Absolutely. <laughs> All for that. That's the original WEC super fight. Who wouldn't want to see that? But I also put it as Aldo slash Edgar, but I, I would prefer the Cruz versus Aldo one, definitely. Um, in terms of ones that I think that is likely to happen, but has yet to be made official or had much traction to, you know, negotiations coming out yet. I think uh, Whaley versus Rose, uh, that's obviously seems to be the next strawway title fight. And that's a phenomenal matchup, one that. I'm just ready to see Whaley fight again. You know, it feels like forever since that Joanna fight, one of the greatest fights ever. Um, dying just to see her back against anybody. Uh, Rose makes for a very interesting fight. Whaley likes that matchup. I think that one has fireworks written all over it. Whenever it happens, I would hope for before the end of the year. Uh, I think that's a good one that I'm really excited for. Um, you know, both both girls put on great fights no matter who it's against. So putting them against each other, that's going to be awesome. Hoping and assuming that it happens. Uh, another one that I threw out there is Ryan Hall versus anyone because we all want to see Ryan Hall back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was about to say, like, you know, the first two matchups were, you know, title implicating fights and then you throw Ryan Hall into the mix. And, uh, you know, I don't know where to go from there. You kind of threw me off my track. But I'll go ahead and give you guys one that has been really, you know, kind of on the forefront of my mind in recently recent days. And it goes back to their Twitter back and forth. And that is the two names that I mentioned at the top of this video, Conor McGregor, Dustin Poirier. I want to see that matchup. I want to see him run it back is one I've wanted to see for years, considering how the first one went and considering their growth as fighters since that moment, because Dustin Poirier obviously got his title shot, didn't go his way. Conor has obviously been at the top of the mountain, but you know, he's off doing whatever God knows what outside of the fighting world right now. And when he comes back, the circumstances, the timing, everything works out for Connor versus Dustin too at the much higher weight class. If they want to usher in a 165 pound division with that fight being like the first title fight, because, you know, we got to put Connor in a title fight somehow. Right. So go ahead and do that. I wouldn't be mad at that. I don't care if Dustin's coming off of, you know, the Khabib thing, who cares? Make it happen. UFC's done done crazier. So that is my first pick, but I have other ones and I'd like to get your guys uh, feedback on these. All right. So whoever wants to take this, what do you think about Nate Diaz versus Dan Hooker? I like it. I'm I'm all for it. It, it sounds like an action fight. It sounds like a striker's delight. It there's so many fun things that can happen in that matchup. The only um X factor I see with that is is that a big enough fight to lure Nate Diaz? Like that, that's really always the thing you have to, to question with him, because even though he isn't a, a top rate contender at lightweight or welterweight, you know, it's only going to be the most high profile of names um, that are most likely near the championship uh, level that are going to get him out of bed. So I, I find it hard to believe that Dan Hooker is going to be the guy to to lure him away from a, a streak of fights that includes Jorge Masvidal with The Rock in attendance and you know conor mcgregor twice and anthony pettis but maybe 
maybe that that can happen purely because it will be the sort of fight that he likes to get into. So sign me up for that. Yeah, I mean, it was really surprising to see that Nate kind of even acknowledged Dan Hooker's existence, right? That was this week where he said he's the best welterweight in the world <laughs> or something weird. Like, <laughs> something really Nate Diaz-ish, let's put it that way. Um, as for that matchup, yeah, that would obviously be a very fun fight. I think I would favor Hooker pretty pretty easily. You know, I think he just has more weapons in his toolbox and is more of a finisher, all that. Um, just an overall better fighter right now. Um, and he's fought a lot more elite competition recently, you know, just... I could go on and on about that. And then from a pure standpoint, I really don't like it very much because I don't think Diaz should be, you know, getting kind of those spots when it's a very crowded division and there's so many other contenders in lightweight. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of like, yeah, Hooker's coming off a loss. I mean, things are kind of shuffling about above him. So, yeah, I guess it's good for the meanwhile and, you know, it would be a very fun fight. Like, we just know that's a pretty much a guarantee with those two guys, I mean, no matter who they're going against. Um, so the purist in me doesn't like it very much, but I can make an exception. But as from a fight fan perspective, yeah, that's an awesome fight, of course. Hey, let me uh, throw a monkey wrench in this program for just a second here. While we're talking about Nate Diaz and, and potential matchups, give me Michael Chandler. I think that's a great introduction for Chandler into the UFC. It's a fight that I would favor him to win. Um, but it's a huge name that everybody will be watching. And either way, the UFC can be very happy with, with the outcome. So if if Chandler wins, he has the perfect springboard into title contention in the UFC's light weight division. He can make a lot of moves from there, draw a lot of interest. And then if Nate wins, then, OK, now we have another excuse to throw him at the top of the heap um, and he'll say something that probably goes viral afterward and we'll all be happy for forward uh, from a promotional standpoint. But I think that fight right there makes a whole lot of sense for both men. Um, so please put that together. I, I like that more than the Dan Hooker one, to be quite honest, probably because I thought of it. It's interesting that you brought up Michael Chandler because that was another name I was about to mention because that's a guy that everybody is really, you know, intrigued to see how he does at this level. But he doesn't have a fight yet. You know, he was he was announced as the backup, you know, for a title fight. But other than that, it's like we don't know what's really going to happen. Like there's nobody on the horizon for him, with the exception of one guy that's been calling him out on Twitter um, in recent days. And that's Islam Makachev. Does that seem like too low down the totem pole for you, though? Um, I mean, it's kind of. For me, yes, because I think that worldwide Chandler is definitely a top 10 lightweight and uh, Makachev isn't quite there yet. You know, he's creeping, obviously, but hasn't really beaten that person to launch him up yet. Dos Anjos was looking to be that guy, assuming that he won. Um, for me, not really, but it's kind of like and then you look at how the UFC is looking at him, though. I think they're treating him a lot better than some of these free agent champions that they bring in, which is surprising sometimes. You know, we've seen it in rare cases with like Eddie Alvarez. Um, that's probably, you know, the best exception. Uh, Gilbert Melendez, I wouldn't count since he was absorbed from Strike Force, you know, got his title shot right away. But um, it's kind of rare that they treat some of these fighters with such good spots right away. Um, and Chandler's getting, you know, one of the best spots that you could ask for where he's a replacement potentially for the title fight. So I don't know if that's the direction they want to go. I feel like they could have him one fight away from a title fight, obviously, um, with how he's could get it if something happens here. Um it would be a very interesting fight for both guys, that's for sure. But, you know, I, I like I do want to say about Ant's idea for the Diaz matchup. I think business wise, that's a pretty amazing idea. If you want to sell and expose this new shiny object that Chandler is to the UFC audience, that's about as perfect as can be, because that's a, an amazing matchup for him. I'd have trouble seeing him lose to Diaz because if he just wrestles him, it should be pretty clear victory. I don't see him getting caught. You know, he was able to get past uh, Goichi Yamauchi, who a lot of people that or don't watch Bellator might not know who he is, but that's a very lethal submission artist uh, who submitted a lot of people in Chandler did just fine against him dominated for the most part. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably the best business move to go from here. If he's not going to get a title shot right away with things not happening. Uh, Makachev, yeah, that seems down, down a little bit too low. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. I don't know. I can't see the Diaz one happening from a Diaz end. Of course, Chandler would probably take that in a heartbeat, but I don't know if Diaz would be like, Oh, this new guy, you know, he'd treat him like that. <laughs> I think one one thing that we have to keep in mind too, when the UFC is bringing over someone so high profile from another organization, 
it's usually not for cheap, at least cheap by UFC standards. So the money that they're that they're getting paid, it it means you have to have some sort of either really high level opponent or a high level name opponent. And and that just narrows the field down. You, you look at, um, you know, most of the champions that have come over, like Jake Shields was thrown in at the top of the welterweight heap immediately, had to fight Martin Campman. Uh, before he he got to meet George St. Pierre. Uh, Hector Lombard, if I'm not mistaken, was it Tim Bosch yep. that he debuted against? And, you know, at the time, Tim Bosch was 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 for sure a top 10 guy. Um, so you you have to see something like that. And in Eddie Alvarez's case, I mean, he came in against Donald Cerrone, who um, at the time was a surging lightweight. Um, in fact, he got to the title uh, shot against Dos Anjos off of Eddie Alvarez's back in, in part. So um, you you have to pair them up like that. So you're you're going to get you got to get uh, a Nate Diaz or this current version of Donald Cerrone uh, if you want that that sexy name on the marquee. Uh, but, or you got to go with um, the Dustin Poirier's, the you know the the uh, Charles Oliveras, the guys that are that are absolute upper le- echelon in the division to justify the paycheck that they're going to be given to Chandler for for coming into the UFC. Would Tony Ferguson carry enough weight? In that absolutely respect yeah. absolutely i mean he's a former belt holder he is you, you know w- people still talk about his i mean he, he has the the longest win streak in ufc lightweight history i mean that says it all and he's one uh fight removed from that historic record absolutely well you have sold me um at least from in the business side of things, Nate Diaz, Chandler, I'm on board with that now. It's not one, not one that I had on my radar, but hey, I'm, I'm with it now. So uh, good job on selling me on that. Um, I will go with one more. Since this is the Chimaev News Network before we get out of here. <laughs> Obviously, Chimaev does not have a scheduled opponent yet. You know, everybody was talking about, hey, don't put him in there against a Damian Maya at this stage of his career. So obviously the talk is, who is it going to be next? 170, 185, we don't know yet. And uh, my opponent that I had picked out for him, if it was at 185, Marvin Vittori, now is scheduled to fight Jacare. So that is out of the realm of possibility right now. So give me one opponent for Jemaya before we get out of here. Brad Tavares. He's, he's, he's like, like, I like yeah, it. he's like the guy who everybody gets to fight to springboard their way in, into the, the elite of, of the middleweight division. And he's a well-rounded guy. He's someone who I, I don't, th- I can't remember anybody really just breezing through him uh, outside of Adesanya. So yeah, man, g- give me that fight. If, if he can get past uh, Brad Tavares with ease, then we're really looking at somebody special here. Dang. Labeled him with the gatekeeper, Drake. <laughs> Who you got for Chimaev? You know, I kind of joked about this one of the more recent times that we talked about Jemayev, but, um, you know, he's talking a lot lately. He's, he's talking a big game. So, sorry, Chris Weidman, you're getting Jemayev, man. <laughs> that's, my, that's my pick right there. Former champion. That's that's a perfect main event to boost Jemayev's hype train. You know, a good name. For him. <laughs> hey, Chris wants that smoke, man. <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. Um, I know Chris will not take that fight no matter what, because he still believes he's in line for a title shot himself somehow. Um, But for me, I will go with one. I will go with Neil Magny just because that's a guy that will fight anybody at any given time. Um, And that's a perfect place. Like he's, he's not really, he's a, I wouldn't say the Nate Magny or Neil Magny is a gatekeeper per se, but he's that guy that really is more like an entryway into the top, side of the division. So you get past a Neil Magny, then you're really showing something. So I don't know if, I don't know if uh, Brad Tavares will necessarily show that you're ready for the top fives of the world, like a Neil Magny would, but uh, a win over Brad Tavares will show, yeah, I belong in this top 15 for sure. Top 10 for sure. So we'll see what goes from there, but you know, all good matchups. We'll see what happens. Um, Obviously, you know, CNN, we keep our, we keep our ears to the streets when it comes to my So, Uh, Stay tuned for more to my breaking news. CNN signing off.